Welcome to Inside the Arena, your source for everything off the ice, off the court, and outside the field of play. With your hosts, Como Sports Director Nico Tamurian and Como Senior Reporter Chris Daniels. They're all applauding for David Lee. I think so. Chris, could you imagine if we had that kind of intro everywhere we went? Like, Chris Daniels walks through the door at Como, and it's like, joining us now is Chris Daniels. Come on, man. Right? It, it would be awesome. And, and he's got the pipes, man. That guy's oh, been yeah. doing it for years as one of the radio voices uh, for the NFL. And it's great to have him as part of Inside the Arena. We're now on episode number 10. Every week, we're talking about stuff that's going on, on off the ice, off the field, off the court, and, and this is no different. We've been hitting all the, the bases, so to speak, on all the audio platforms, and, and really, you know, we've, we've talked to Kenny Main. Uh, we've, we've had Caitlin Clark, a snippet of Caitlin Clark, yeah. talking about Seattle on this show, Lenny Wilkins, others. Uh, it has been fun to talk about the philanthropic efforts and really the business side of sports here. Yeah, no question about it, and, and that's what – this show is about okay we all know who won the game we all can see with our own two eyes if we think this team's good or bad but what you don't see is what's going on behind the scenes to make those stories to hopefully bring back the sonics to hopefully make this a smooth transition you like this I, I for do. our local schools into the big 10 that was very nice because like that? that is one of the issues and really in the last <laughs> week it, it's come to the forefront once again that that this is real the yeah. UW and WSU are no longer in the same conference. I hate it. Uh, yeah. I get it, but I, I just like it. Yeah, I mean, it's all about money. And, and, you know, for the University of Washington, I think there's a lot of unchartered territory here as they officially have joined the Big Ten Conference. Uh, they're spending money to get ready for the Big Ten Conference. They're spending money still on the renovation of Husky Stadium. There's a lot of things going on off the field that fans uh, and and people who maybe work or or go to the school, don't even think about. Right. Uh, this was a, a move made, and I think everybody would acknowledge, uh, whether you're a fan of U, UW or WSU, uh, all about the money and, and making sure that everybody was financially secure for the next several years based on a TV contract. And, oh, by the way, we will figure out everything after that. Well, and that's just that the landscape has just been an epic, epic shift. And I know I've mentioned it on this show before, but the uh, predecessor to the man you talked to, Troy Dan and he told me, you know, if we thought the last couple of years of college sports were crazy, the next three to five are going to put it to shame. And I wonder what that means around the country. But here in town, that means UW trying to figure out what this means after over a century in the pack, whatever it was at that time, you know, trying to figure out what it means to now be in a largely Midwest school and trying to figure out everything that comes with having a seat at the table, which is what they achieved. And, and kudos to the dogs. And, and that's hugely important because the alternative is not that great. However, there's a lot of unknowns that come with it. Well, and and one of the crazy sidebars of this whole story is the fact that the guy who was fighting to keep Washington State University relevant, Pat Chun, then the athletic director for Washington State, uh, as the Pac-12 fell apart, has now crossed the Cascades and is working for the University of Washington, trying to help UW now navigate this kind of weird territory with with travel and finances and building out new facilities pat chun went from the washington state university athletic director position he's now the university of washington's lead athletic director and and doing it all here on the west side of the state i had a chance to talk to him about all the changes that he knows about and all the changes he doesn't yet and we had a lengthy conversation about it here's pat chun Thanks, Pat, for doing this. Thanks for, uh, thanks for coming. Uh, what has the last five years been like for you? I mean, just in terms of you and your family and all the stuff that's happened, navigating COVID, NIL changes, the Pac-12 breaking up, and then you jumping to the UW. It's been a, a crazy five years for you personally. Yeah, if you'd asked me that five years ago, what's the next five years going to be like, I would not have answered uh, probably that question correctly. You know, if anything, I look back on the last five years and I'm, you know, I'm, I've, I've been fortunate to be surrounded by a great team of people, whether it's at here at the UW or at Washington State, 
always focused on what's best for your students, or in our case, our student athletes. And you know, from a personal and professional standpoint, you know, any any time you go through whatever whatever adversity is in front of you, um, it's always opportunities to grow and learn and learn about yourself. And you know, at the end of the day, we're we're all you know we're all trying to be the best we're supposed to be. And you know, f fortunately for me, I've had you know, some tests to get there, like a lot of people in and around higher ed or in and around college athletics. But it's been a, you know, it's, it's been a, you know, you could not have scripted what the last, you know, couple, last handful of years could have looked like. Uh, people in this state already know you from, from Washington State. I made the, the, the joke at your introductory press conference that a lot of people leave for rivals all the time. I left for a rival in television. You've left for a rival university in, in college athletics have you have you patched up everything there with the university president as as you move forward here yeah i mean all of our conversations have been um great between kirk and myself and obviously they've they've slowed down quite a bit you know he's got he's got to run a university and i have a new task here but you know it was not you know our expectation and the reality of the move was we were going to maintain friendships with the lifelong friends we made. Um, there was a lot in Seattle, a lot of Cougs that, um, you know, that were happy that we moved to a city that we already have friends. And, you know, you also understand that what makes Washington State so special is the passion uh, that Cougs have for Washington State. And you understand that, um, you know, the, the fans of Washington State are going to, we're never going to be happy with the move. But life's about relationships and, you know, the friendships we made. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, that that that's that's part of the fun part of moving to Seattle is it's the one community we moved to that we, you know, my wife, myself, even our daughters have friends right away. So Apple Cup's going to be fun for you. Uh, it'll be unique. Yeah, <laughs> it'll be unique. Yeah, I don't know if fun's the right word, but uh, yeah, it, it's, uh, uh, it, it, you know, it, there, there's real, you know, as I think I said in, said in the press conference, there's real human emotions uh, with all these, with, 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 with anything when you, when you, when you move when you move jobs or, or when you make, make significant decisions or changes. And, you know, there's a lot of people I care about, you know, over at Washington State and that's never gonna change. And, uh, but I have a, you know, different responsibility today and it centers around this athletic program. And, you know, I'm fortunate, you know, if anything, it'll be, you know, you know I'll, I'm sure I'll take a deep breath and look around Lumen and, you know, take, take a lot of, you know, pride in knowing that, you know, one of the great rivalries in college sports um, you know, I get to, you know, I get the unique perspective of being on both sides of the rivalry. Yeah, so let's let's get to what's ahead here. Troy Dannon, he made it from October to March. You've already made it from March to August, so you, you've almost equaled him in terms of your time <laughs> here at the University of Washington. It's, it feels like, though, it's been a, a sprint to get ready for the Big Ten. We can see the logo down on the on Husky Stadium, Alaska Airlines Field here as we sit here. But what have you been focused on here out of the gate? For me, one, it was always going to be um, assimilating to be a part of this athletic department. Uh, you know, I've told everyone I'm going to earn my right to be part of this team. Uh, but really trying to get to understand all of our coaches. Uh, at the end of the day, they, they are the ones that have the biggest impact on the experience of our student athletes. You know, I inherited a great group of coaches. Uh, also started really at the same time as our head football coach, Jed Fish, and our men's basketball coach, Danny Sprinkle. And then we fired a women's gymnastics coach and a baseball coach since. So it, it's it's just trying to get, you know, just, you know, life's, you know, I'm we all, like, at the end of the day, we are responsible for building up young people. We do it a lot of a lot of a lot of our method is doing it through team sports. Uh, for us to to use team sports to do that, we have to figure out how to be a great team, uh, and a lot of that comes from relationships. And the reality, we've all been a part of great teams. You know, uh, great teams take time to build relationships, and that's where I've been putting a lot of my time. And now we're we're prepping for this historic you know official move to the Big Ten. Um, there are tremendous amount of opportunities uh, that that are present and in our future in the Big Ten. Uh, you know, the big, big, easiest example is the Pac-12 network, I think was in roughly 15 million homes. And, you know, we're not going to be in a platform that isn't at least in 100 million homes. So it's, it's just, it's a whole different uh, opportunity for our university and our athletes. But also it's, you know, there's, there's, there's different challenges on top of it. We, you know, we, I can make a pretty fact-based argument that UW believes the Pac-12 is uh, the highest performing, you know, one of the highest performing, if not the highest performing school over the last decade. Um, you know, when I looked at recent numbers, we were second in operating budget uh, in the Pac-12. And when you look at the Big Ten, we slide in at number 10. So there's a lot of um, there's a lot of challenges for the four for all the all, you know all the all 12 Pac-12 schools uh, are financially damaged by decisions made for the last decade and for us we go into a league that has been financially advantaged and you know we have challenges that go with that. So one of the things 
when this all went down and it, it, it preceded you taking this job at UW is is there just there wasn't like the action plan ready right it was everybody is going to take this deal with with this conference or that conference and and then try to figure out scheduling yeah. later where are you with scheduling because it seems like that's the biggest headache as you try to get this thing going well that was and then we get into this house settlement with revenue share so that and that's as fresh as last you know a couple fridays ago i guess um so it, it's it's one working i guess it, it's two things one the goal is always to put our student athletes in the best position to be successful to working with a, a, a conference that is um, trying to work as effectively and as efficiently as possible to ensure that we're, we're, we're scheduled correctly. Uh, there are going to be um, good decisions, decisions we're going to want to improve on. But I think when it comes to scheduling, it's just really going to come down to, you know, we're going to get through, we're going to get through this year. We're going to learn some stuff in real time. And, you know, we'll take the appropriate time after each season has ended to say to to work with our conference and say, hey, this has worked well for us. This hasn't worked well. You know, how can we avoid the things that that haven't wor haven't worked well? Quickly, uh, you just mentioned revenue share, yeah. uh, how that is connected to scheduling. Well, it's just, it's become the bigger problem. I shouldn't say that. It's become the bigger change is probably a better way to put it. So uh, this this um, house case that, that there's a proposed settlement on, on the table, uh, now the new challenge is, um, We'll, we will, you know, assuming Judge Wilkin in Northern California approves it, uh, we will then be in a model in which, you know, you know, upwards of $22 million in year one will be could be shared uh, with our student athletes. So um, it, it's a it's a fundamental change in college athletics. Uh, it'll force us to change. It'll force us to change our business model. Uh, not only us, but every school in in you know in the in the highest levels of of, of Division One or, or FBS football. So that is that has become the new you know the the new um, the new unknown that we're contemplating with 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 revenue share. So on scheduling again, how is it supposed to work? Football, I think people have seen that schedule, but I looked at. You know the schedules that have been announced for other yeah. teams, women's soccer as Iowa, Nebraska, Indiana, Ohio State yeah. in October. Volleyball, Ohio State, Penn State, Minnesota. I mean, these are road games in the the fall and, and potentially bad weather yeah. uh, parts of the year. I haven't seen the schedules yet for the the other teams. Yeah, the spring leagues, or the spring teams. Those aren't yet. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, where are you in, in developing that schedule and? And making sure that you actually have the adequate travel to get back. Yeah, I think that that's probably the the first part. Is once, once schedules came out, um, we started to look at um, the impact on class, uh, missing class specifically, uh, where we can utilize. You know, where there are direct flights. We're fortunate to be in Seattle, where there's uh, direct flights to a lot of different cities. But some of those cities in the Big Ten aren't covered just because they're you know they're small college towns. So then just trying to be you know just trying to be strategic in when we use uh, you know charter air uh, to make sure our kids are back uh, because of the you know you got time change and you got um, you know distance and ultimately you know all of our young people are still here for academics so each sport will have its own unique differences nuances and like I said those are things that as as a year progresses and as the year ends you know we'll collect real time information and you know try to figure out how to do better the following year so still a work in progress it's always I think it's going to be a work in progress you know, for a while. Because charter planes for, you know, those volleyball, women's soccer games, is that is that something that's doing? I think it's it not, it's just going to come down to we're looking at each trip individually based on flight availability and return relative to class. You know, football is going to be different too. I mean, we could, you know, it's, um, you know, we, we you know, we, we're on a Friday night in Rutgers. You know, it's, it's there's different challenges with, you know, with, with going multiple time zones and, and you know, to play, to play games. And we're going to, we're, I don't, you know, a national conference really hasn't happened till this year, so that's why there there really isn't a benchmark we can. None of us, uh, you know, none of the four schools on the West Coast can can look at it and say, oh, that's 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 probably the most efficient, effective way to do things. So I think we're going to go through the year and figure that out. Any any way to say just how much more it's going to cost to travel this year? Uh, that I don't have, but it, it's going to be it's going to be an uptick. It's you know it's part of being in the in a you know in. A, you know, one of the, you know, the arguably the premier conference in all of college athletics. So you were just talking about Pac-12 networks going to Big Ten. Uh, I know you just went to the Regents to ask for 18 million for building out that area near Heckhead. I'm always going to call it Heckhead. 
but the, the the east side of Heckhead for a TV facility. Yes. What yes. Is, what is that all about? So um, part of where we part of our, one of our partners is, is is well, let me rephrase it. The Big Ten Network is is partially owned by Fox. They're our, they're, they're our business partner, our television partner. They have requirements specific to broadcasting on campus. So it's one. It's it, I think it one. It speaks to the quality in which they want to produce content, but also too, it's an opportunity for uh, campus, for students, uh, for um, real, real um, practical experiences for students to come in uh, because it'll be it'll be operated you know by our campus so it's it's it, I think the cool thing for us is it puts a high-end TV production center um, that ultimately becomes a lab for a certain segment of students on our campus to get real skills that want to you know become the next uh, next Chris Daniels or people that work work with Chris Daniels <laughs> Well, I mean the the finances of all this, and, and granted, you're still you're still figuring all this out, and I think everybody appreciates that. Uh, but there's debt on Husky Stadium uh, in terms of the the redevelopment of Husky Stadium. Yeah. The University of Washington not alone in that, yeah. and and that was an issue for a lot of universities that were deciding to make a move to a, a different conference. Yeah. Where does all that stand right now with restructuring the debt on Husky Stadium, how that factors into this as you move into this new conference? Yeah, well, so when I, um, upon taking this job, I think it was made very clear to me by leadership, you know, on campus that uh, we're gonna work on all these things together. You know, the university, the regents, the president all recognize the benefits of high level athletics on campus. And I think we're also fortunate that we have a football program that um, won its conference, won the Pac-12, but also went to you know the highest level of college football, and all the um, the halo effect that happens with that, all the additional exposure, all the connectivity with with alums and fans, and um, I, there it kind of reinforced the impact college athletics can have. So um, we are right, we are no different than, than many of our peer institutions. Uh, we're, ba we're balancing a budget that, that has uh, debt service a part of it. Uh, we also have uh, new bills coming on with, with travel and you know, we're in half a share for the next you know, handful of years in the Big Ten. So those are all things that you know, we're gonna work with campus to try to position ourselves in the best, best, best foot forward. But uh, you know, I'm fortunate or we're fortunate in athletics that you know, we, we all work at a university that puts a value on college athletics. Because correct me if I'm wrong, you have a different set of finances. You have your own budget in athletics versus academics. Yes, there. we're an auxiliary. To but campus. in this particular case, you've had to, to go seek money. We've had to work with campus to, to try to alleviate some of you know the reality of, of where we're at with our budget coming out of the pandemic. You know the, we're no different than a lot of athletic programs that had to shift dollars to to, to um, cover shortfalls and you know the out years have, have had impact. And you know we have you know the reality is where we're headed. You know there's there's bigger bills to pay. So you just mentioned the word realities. I did watch the Big Ten Network. Um, and you said something about you're dealing with realities versus choices in the future. You said it a couple of times. What does that mean? So joining the Big Ten, I think, is it, there, there's there's many um, there are. Well, let me start here. College athletics has, has shifted. We've all lived it in the state of Washington, and whether it's whether it's um, television and and. The resources that are put into the, the the college football system because of TV, whether it's uh, Supreme Court rulings, uh, you know, local courts uh, making decisions on behalf of institutions, all these things are pulling college athletics in a different place. Um, our old model, you know, whatever the old model of yesterday is, is no longer exists. So with the onset of NIL, with the freedom movement, with transferring, with uh, revenue share around the on the horizon. One of the benefits of being in the Big Ten is, is as, as the future is being shaped, we are one of the two conferences that'll have the biggest say in how that future is shaped. So to be at the table with, with, with the Big Ten, understanding that now from a future standpoint, we have the security you know, with being with like institutions in, a major, in, in the major conference and making decisions in an unknown environment is just just is just a is is the right place for a school like Washington to be, because I heard that, and I could be incorrect. I don't want to take your words out of context. Yeah. I, I heard that and thought, oh, that means you may have to cut sports because of 
everything that we just talked about with with NIL and the Supreme Court decision and the revenue sharing and all of that, it's a whole different world. And I heard realities versus choices and thought, oh, is, is Pat talking about cutting sports? Yeah, I was not. Um, but it, it, you know, we're going to have to take a, a look at our budget and see where, you know, we'll have to, you know, we'll, we'll do what, 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 you know, most, most athletic departments will do. We'll figure out where we can increase revenue. We'll figure out where we can increase fundraising and we'll figure out where we can control some more costs. But we're at 22 sports. Uh, this university is very comfortable with the 22 sport model. Uh, ironically, in the Big Ten, that does not put us in the upper half in terms of sports sponsorship. We could join a league where there's multiple schools with over 30 sports each. Uh, we believe in a, in a broad-based athletic program that brings, uh, you know, di diverse people to our campus. And, um, you know, we'll, you know, if th those things have never been discussed, um, you know, with me on, on this campus. So we'll end with this. You, you unlike, I think, arguably unlike most athletic directors across the country at big universities, had a front seat like nobody else in terms of being on the other side, trying to keep Washington State in the game and in, into a conference, and now you're at a university where you're directing a school into a new conference, and there's still a lot of questions about whether we're done yeah. with realignment. Do you think we're done with realignment? No, we are not. I, I, I There's, and it's just as the the, you know, the velocity of change feels like it's been as fast as it's ever been. Um, it, it, you know, this is all prognosticating, but my assumption is um, the wheels of realignment will continue to churn outside of the Big Ten and the SEC. Um, a lot of this realignment started with decisions made by Texas and Oklahoma and thus, thus uh, the two Los Angeles schools, and that kind of just started started the whole this, this, this cycle of realignment. But as TV continues to change, uh, we just saw in real time, you know, I know you, you track on sports business, the amount of dollars that are put in the NFL, the additional dollars that the NBA just took up. There's finite dollars in the whole TV ecosystem anyways. You know, we're in one of the two conferences where TV is, uh, that we're in, you know, that have the, the strongest brands and arguably the Big Ten has the strongest of the brands, including Washington. And TV, is, TV will continue to invest in the strongest brands and that's going to impact realignment as well where TV dollars, you know, start to evaporate from in other conferences. So those, those what is driving realignment and football specifically um, will continue to drive realignment, which is, you know, which is, which is, you know, economics. You know, and Chris, and hearing that certainly it, it does make it more real. <laughs> I mean, we're talking just a couple weeks from seeing this new football season, but also seeing you dub play big 10 conference games in September. That's just going to be weird. And, and Pat Chun is the second athletic director now to be on this show. We had Washington state mm -hmm. university, then interim athletic director, Ann McCoy, She's now dropped that interim tag. She's now trying to find a place for Washington State here in the near future, and they really only have a few months to figure that out uh, with all the way the TV contracts work. And all that. I agree. I, I think that somewhere along the line, just knowing how there's going to be seismic shifts all over, I think I don't think it remains the Pac-2 forever. Whether at the the base floor is some kind of merger with the Mountain West, which I know they've shown lukewarm interest in. Above that, you see the ACC in flux. The ACC has already come west. If they lose some especially big-time programs, I could see them going to the Oregon State, Washington State route to give Stanford and Cal travel partners and make that a league. And, and listen, I still think, I don't think the Big 12 is done. I mean, their commissioner, Brett Yormark, is adamant that they're going to try and be right up there with the SEC and Big 10. Now, how do the Cougs factor into that? Their profile fits a lot of Big 12 schools right? It doesn't have to be in a huge metropolitan area. I, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is I really truly believe that the Cougs and the Beavers, they will be in a, a league league as much as the Pac-2 is a league. But you know what I'm saying? A, an established league in the next three to four years. That's my prediction. Washington as a state is has twice the population, more than twice the population of the state of Iowa, which has two schools in those major yeah. conferences. You know, all this conversation is making me nostalgic. Oh, see, now you set me up perfectly. <laughs> oh, and I want to say one last thing about that. I, I do not discount the fact that the Big 12 may come to Washington to add Gonzaga for their basketball profile and the Cougs in all sports. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's, that's a possibility. That's, I, I, they flirted with the Zags before. But yes, being nostalgic, um, certainly in these crazy times, ever since 
the pandemic, when people had nothing else to do and were stuck in their house and they dug out their old binders of sports cards, the sports card and memorabilia industry has been on a skyrocket. And so um, I know when my son was born in 2021, I decided to make it a point to get rookies of all the years, his first seasons, and that included like Julio and stuff. And I found a local card shop in Renton, DJ Sports Cards. They've been there since 1988. And so for our show, I wanted to talk to DJ about this surge in memorabilia and sports cards. What has made this thing explode? Because look, you go online, there's groups everywhere. There's a Facebook group called Sports Card Nonsense. It has like 250,000 followers. It's, it's just crazy. A, the interest in this. B, the money people are spending on this. But I also wanted to take it a step further. We talk about the Sonics every week. Um, he's got some, A, really cool Sonics pieces, but he also lets us know the Sonics memorabilia you may be hanging on to, or maybe you're excited about their potential return and you want to pick up some cards or some other really unique and cool items that DJ has. He shows us all. Here's my conversation with Don Joss of DJ Sports Cards. Sports memorabilia, cards specifically, kind of born out of the pandemic, I, su I suppose. Like it was always there, but it, the uptick, I suppose. Yeah, the hit hobby's there. been around forever. The big boom was late 80s, early 90s, and then that kind of crashed, and it was, it was kind of slow going for a long time. But probably in the 2010s, it had been slowly, slowly ticking up again. But then the pandemic really made it explode. Everybody was stuck at home with nothing to do. They started watching card breaks on TV. They were watching old reruns of games because there was no current games going. That Michael Jordan 10-hour miniseries on, on ESPN got everybody interested in Michael Jordan cards. And all of a sudden, everybody couldn't wait to get back in the card shop again. And it hasn't waned since then. Like Some people may have thought, like, okay, once life gets somewhat back to normal... But if anything, it's even uptick since then. Is that? Yeah, and one thing one thing that it was encouraging was I was afraid that some of the skyrocketing prices would scare people out of it again. But things settled down, but people still stayed. So there's still just a huge amount of people that have kind of rediscovered it again. People that did collect 30 years ago have rediscovered it. Kids are into it big time. You know, it's it's an all ages thing. There's a, there's a good female population of collectors as well. So, and it's not seen as a nerd thing now. I mean, people, <laughs> people will bump into each other here that like work together and they didn't know like, oh, you collect cards too. And then now they've got a new thing to talk about at work, but it's, it's an all ages, very accepted thing now. And one thing, and certainly something that's obvious to you and I who follow this sort of thing, but you know, for folks who maybe haven't collected in say 30 years, I mean, the stuff that's out there now is, you know, there's, there's pieces of jerseys, there's autographs. I'm, I'm talking specifically cards in this regard, I suppose, but um, it's changed a lot, and maybe even for the better in what the average customer can find in a pack or whatever. Yeah, what, one thing that happened after the market crashed 30 years ago is the companies had to get a lot more innovative with what they were putting in their packs. So we started seeing serial numbered cards, hologram cards, glossy cards, cards with a piece of it. It started with a, a race used tire piece, and then the, the other sports companies started putting bats and balls and jerseys into the cards as well. So jersey cards. Autograph cards became more prevalent. Those were really hard to get. Uh, the first attempt at that was in 1990. Upper Deck put a Ridgie Jackson autograph in, the, in their product. And he, uh, the, the guy that came up with that came up with the idea from watching uh, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory with the golden ticket. But you think, why didn't people think to put autographs in before? But that's what finally got that going. And now there's all kinds of products with autographs in them. So you know, we're not looking at the kind of cheap old cardboard, which is still fun and nostalgic. The cards now are just gorgeous. I mean, a lot of them are like little works of art. And, and, and generally speaking, I mean, when you see... I mean, sports fans are sports fans. They're always going to be diehards for their team. But how much does, and maybe especially in this most recent boom, how much does collecting, whether it's cards or memorabilia, almost enhance that fandom? Like, how, how often have you seen maybe a Mariners fan or a Kraken fan, whatever it might be, come in here, and because they're a diehard Mariners fan, um, maybe have that enhanced by whatever, that Julio card or that whatever bobblehead or whatever it might be? Well, I always tell people, when you go to the game and come home, you spend a lot of money and you've got a good memory, but you don't have anything tangible. With cards and collectibles, you have something you can look at later and enjoy it. And it may go up in value as well. It can become a collectible or something too. So I think it's nice to have something that you can actually take home and enjoy permanently versus just a game you went, you came back home, and all you've got is your memories. And there's a certain rush about ripping a pack too, right? Oh my gosh. It's, it's like every pack is like a little Christmas present. I mean, you might get an autograph or some rare card or the hot new rookie. You might get, they might be horrible players, but then you go back a year from now and some rookie out of there caught on and now all of a sudden he's worth a lot of money. That happens all the time. People go through stuff they opened a year or two prior and now there's new hot players that caught on afterwards. And as we kind of keep riding this wave in, the, in this industry, so to speak, as it gets more and more popular, where do, you, where do you see this going from here? Like in the future, I know it's hard to predict that sometimes, but where do you see the next steps? Is it, does it kind of continue in this thing it's going or is there other 
products down the pipeline that people are really into? Like, what what is the next few years of collecting look it, like? It's a good question because we we like to see innovation and in, in, you know the online things and stuff. But part of the draw of this hobby is is kind of this just traditional, open a pack like people have been doing for decades. You know, kind of we want to see newer innovations and and other things come out of it. But at the same time, just that tradition of opening packs, collecting a set, or collecting your player. That's that's what grabs a lot of people. So I don't know that we need to have any crazy innovations coming, but it you know it'd be nice to see some. But the tradition of card collecting, I think that's part of what makes it attractive people. It's kind of a it's it's, it's not a, it's it's not an online go on my phone and do this and that. It's just it's like paper and cardboard right in front of you that you can handle and touch. Absolutely, um, having something right in front of you that you can see and touch, I, I suspect means probably more for a Sonics fan that hasn't had a team to be able to watch the last 16 years. What is that dynamic like? Um, you, you, I'm sure maybe it's uptick the last maybe couple of years as we've seen maybe uh, signs of expansion, but what is that dynamic like with their departure and people maybe getting their hopes up a couple times in the last few years? What is that? Yeah. It really crushed the town. I had a lot of people that quit collecting basketball at that point, and then there's still some people that kind of stay away from it. But a lot of younger kids that have grown up and don't even remember the Sonics are following the NBA. They're buying cards. They, they wear Sonic hats and shirts like they know they had a team and they collect some of those players, but it'll be great to actually have them back again someday and be part of that league again. Absolutely, it's crazy to me that there is essentially a generation of, of kids right now that if you're younger than 16, or maybe even a little older than that because of your memories or whatever, you, you don't remember having an NBA team. Yeah, How crazy, the, yeah. On, on all the talent that came, all the players, you know, the Jamal Crawfords and all the guys that came from this area, and, and we don't have a team here, it's just really bizarre. And is, so in the last couple of years, now that it's seen, now that we got Climate Pledge and the Kraken, and there's, you know, okay, like the biggest issue being the arena has now been solved, right? Yeah. Have you noticed maybe in the last couple of years an uptick in, in Sonic's, whatever it might be, cards, memorabilia? Sonic's always sell. There's just, there's so many good memories. One thing I explained to the younger kids is just, it was amazing how passionate this town was about the Sonics. Every regular season game was a big deal. You were getting together with your friends and sometimes paying pay-per-view for a regular season game, but every game counted, every game was a big deal. But yeah, we sell a lot of Sonic stuff. I, people may have quit the, the NBA collecting for a while, but they didn't quit the Sonics. They still collected, you know, the championship teams, the Fred Browns and the Jack Sigmas, and then all the, the 90s greats, the Sean Kemp's and the Gary Paytons and all those guys too. And what is it, you kind of, you've kind of said it there, but what does it say about Sonics fans in particular that it's been 16 years and you're, you have a whole case, of, and we'll show it in a second. You have a whole case of Sonics cards here. Yeah. I mean, and, and I'm sure they sell. Oh, they sell great. Yeah, what does it say about the fans in this town? Uh, they're, they're loyal. They miss their team. They were treated poorly by the NBA. That should have never happened. And, and it'll be great to get them back. And as far as when, we're going to say when at this point. <laughs> Not to get anybody's hopes up, but you, can, you know, we're in, that, we're in the home stretch here, hopefully. Yeah. Hopefully it's um, closer now. Uh, should that happen? Um, again how cool would that be from you being a fan perspective but also yeah. from this card and, and memorabilia standpoint I mean how much will that change the game here oh, it'll, it'll be tremendous it'll be nice to be able to open packs of current product and, and have players from our team in there you know they told everyone to just start watching Portland now well how do you take your biggest rival from all those years and all of a sudden I'm supposed to root for that team there's no way we want our Sonics back we want to pull our guys out of the packs yeah, you got me excited to rip open a pack and maybe get an expansion draft pick of Jeff Green or something. Yeah, <laughs> yes. Um, you, you obviously know this better than anybody, and it's certainly me. Is there anything about what we talked about that maybe my questions didn't hit on, whether it's the Sonics gear, whether it's the just the, the, uh, the trend of everything in general that maybe you wanted to talk about that my questions didn't hit on? I just think card collecting is a great hobby. It's fun. It, it's not crazy expensive it's something a collector on any budget can enjoy and the northwest is filled with a lot of great hobby stores that have been around for decades ready to serve you when you walk in their doors actually i do have one more question and i know this is kind of like a it's a tough answer i'm just asking from a viewer perspective somebody who's hanging on to that sonics card from the 90s that gary payton rookie or whatever it might be um you know, the value of that, did that, I mean, just because there wasn't a team here, did that go up because of that? Or does it, can, when they come back, does that affect that sort of thing? I, I think the, the biggest value is the memories. I, a lot of Supersonics cards are not that expensive. Uh, the championship team, the biggest stars were Dennis Johnson and Jack Sickman. You could buy their rookies for a few dollars. Uh, Gary Payton and Sean Kemp were great stars, but their rookie cards came out during that era where cards were being printed in great quantities. So they're very easy to come by. So most Sonics cards from that, that era when they played are not crazy expensive, 
But again, the memories and the fun of enjoying them, that's your main value. Chris, I will point out, by the way, DJ, for part of Topps Night at the Mariners, DJ just threw out the first pitch in a Mariners game. Oh. Um, got over to the plate. His son, who is now at, working at the shop, he was in, going to college playing baseball at Wenatchee, but his son caught it, and it was a cool family moment. And, uh, yeah, that, that shop is cool, and it's uh, you, you see you walk around, and there's just memorabilia and nostalgia everywhere. I oftentimes go, and don't buy any cards. I buy something just so I'm not taking up his time. Um, but just kind of like in awe, like, wow, look at this history. Sonic's belt buckles from their 1979 <laughs> championship. Like, where are you going to see that elsewhere? I just want to know how, how much the box of 1987 tops baseball cards, how much that's worth today. Cause you remember it was like playing the stock market at one point in yeah. time, you know, the, it was like, I'm going to buy this box and put it away for years. Uh, the, in the nineties and early two thousands, the kind of the market went away and, and there's some strength now in the market with real big time collectors like you talked about. Yeah. And one of the things too, is you look at, okay, 2020, I mentioned that what was big in 2020. It was the only sporting thing airing the last dance, the documentary about the bulls. And so Michael Jordan became, and certainly we knew who he was, but to a new generation of fans, like, Oh yeah, this guy was really pretty awesome. And so his stuff is skyrocketed. He's the one like nineties basketball star that guaranteed his stuff is worth a lot of money. The 86, 87 Fleer rookie, um, you know, if you had it, if you sold it before 2020, you maybe got a few grand for it. If you sold it in 2022, you probably got tens of thousands for it. Um, uh, it is kind of like a stock market thing. And it's, uh, it, it is a cool trip down memory lane. I grew up in the nineties. So sometimes I get those 90, he has unopened boxes from the nineties and I'm thrilled just to get like a, like a Reggie Miller cool card or something like, I was a big Penny Hardaway fan. I mean, that guy was a unicorn in his day. So. Yes, he was. Well, you know, this was uh, this was fun. This was it was like an after school special. Yeah, the very special edition. Inside, me. take us out, David. You've been listening to Inside the Arena with Nico and Chris. Please subscribe on your favorite platform. Until next time.